You all good? Yep. All right. <clears throat> the sport of eventing and riding in general has an artistry that survives the test of time. A training system that was once used for sheer survival and longevity of your most important equipment, the horse, is now the true horseman's Bible to making a great partnership in sport and pleasure. With me, Jimmy Whopper is a well-decorated competitor with medals from Olympic Games to championships. He has produced more Olympic athletes than anyone I know and influenced many more. Today, if you want to learn how to train the three-day event horse and rider, there are several books written by Jimmy, including a new book about to hit the shelves called Still Horse Crazy After All These Years. If it didn't happen this way, it should have. Jimmy has a long history working with some of the greats and have made equestrian sport what it is today. I am honored and most, most interested in everything he has to teach us. So fill your cup or glass with a drink of your favorite choice as we learn from one of the greats. Welcome, Jimmy Whopper. Eric, thank you very much for having me on tonight. Thank you. I know we've talked a little bit um, about a system and this is what I'm most interested in hearing about your history and system and some of the writers that have influenced you through that system. Um, can you fill us in? Sure, that's, there's a lot of that all in one question. First of all, the system that we use is a system that was not designed for our use. This was a system that was developed back in the 1920s uh, to make cavalry more efficient going into combat so that horse and rider could get across country in the most efficient way and arrive where they needed to be in better condition. Over the years, this system was adapted for use in the horse show ring. And so what we see these days has uh, roots going back until almost a hundred years ago now. Wow. So <laughs> That's, that's quite an objective, you know, when you think about a system then compared to now. I mean, the system is basically to survive. The objective is to survive on your horse versus today is maybe a, a different objective. Well, you, you needed to be a good rider in those days. You needed to have horses that were well-trained and those attributes transfer directly uh, to the modern conditions that we see in the competitive ring. You need, you need well-trained horses with good riders. Uh, and that's what I've spent my life uh, trying to obtain. So from what I understand, you've learned from, when you started riding, you've learned from one of these officers as well, including your dad. Can you tell us a little bit about who, one of your uh, major influences that you learned who, who you sure, learned from? My my earliest influences were, of course, my father, and he was a student of the man that invented the system that you and I are talking about, a U.S. cavalry officer. Uh, and my father, being a student of Colonel Chamberlain's, uh, passed that information on to me. And many of my early uh, instructors after my father passed away were also uh, teaching based on Chamberlain's system. Uh, it wasn't until I got to the equestrian team in, in 1965 that I bumped into anyone that had a different system than uh, uh, what we than what I had been raised on. And this is a picture of Harry Chamberlain here. Um, yeah, I, I heard you, you um, said there was a book coming out of Harry Chamberlain uh, or that somebody wrote a biography on Harry Chamberlain that you're writing the forward to? Uh, yes, I've written a forward for a book called uh, America's Equestrian Genius, uh, General Harry D. Chamberlain. And you see the picture of him here and that's a very clear uh, uh, image of what, what Chamberlain had in mind. The weight down in the ankles, a very, very light seat, straight line from the elbow to the horse's back, a nice arch in the loins of the rider, uh, and horse and rider galloping in perfect balance. This was Chamberlain's system, and that is how you would still like to see people going across country today in exactly this shape. Where did he learn the system? 
you you mentioned um, you know from Italian Italian uh, military or where did the forward seat first come from? Well, the forward seat was first invented in about 1898 by an Italian named Federico Caprilli, uh, and he was so successful in his training methods that that most of the uh, cavalry systems around the world changed and adapted. That's a picture of Federico Caprilli jumping a narrow fence probably in about 1905. Uh, you, it, it amazes me sometimes. The things that we think are brand new, these angles and narrows and corners, and here's someone jumping a ladder back kitchen chair uh, at the turn of the last century. Uh, there's nothing really new. It's just that we're just learning about it for the first time. Uh, Caprilli was the first rider who had the rider's weight up over the horse's withers rather than back burdening the horse's loins. Uh, and after World War I, all of the army systems around the world changed. Chamberlain, of course, had been taught to ride backwards like that, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, this was taught in the late 1800s, early 1900s. This wasn't a mistake. This was the way we were supposed to ride. Uh, we now realize how detrimental this, this is to horses, uh, but at the time that was how, how riders rode. And so when Chamberlain came along, he put together this Italian system of going with the horse but he also combined it with dressage as it was taught in France at Saumur at the French cavalry school. And so for the first time, we had a system that included training the horse on the flat to go in a way that you and I would recognize with the what was then called the forward seat uh, and which, which we now would just accept as the correct way to sit on a horse when he's galloping and jumping. Yeah. And I read an article that you came out with uh, appreciating Caprilli's um, equitation and how they used to even jump sabers in the ground. But yes, this, I've, I've seen pictures of military officers jumping a saber stuck in the ground. And I, at the time I said, for heaven's sakes, don't let any of the course designers see this or they'll get ideas. <laughs> <laughs> because so, we've been getting so, narrower and narrower cross country. I, I have a few more. I had a few pictures of cross country of uh, Harry Chamberlain. That's him jumping up. Looks like the Hickstead Bank. Uh, it's a little bit of a Hickstead Bank. I think this was in, in uh, 1928 in Amsterdam at the Olympics. Uh, and that is a, that's a dark brown mare named Nigra. And Nigra was a World War I charger and she had shrapnel in her body. Uh, but she survived World War I and, and uh, returned to use with the Army Horse Show team. And I have a picture of my father riding this mare about five or six years later. Uh, on the picture. back of the photograph uh, in my mother's handwriting is, is the description of Nigra. Wow. And here is your father, I believe. Yes, that's, that's quite a jump there. Uh, the 1932 Olympics in Los Angeles, a horse called Babe Wartham, who had been kind of pressed into service. Babe might have been our best jumper that year, but was also the least trustworthy. But we had some, we had some lamenesses, and so Daddy had to go on this horse. He had quite a fall in the first round, uh, but he came back in the afternoon and jumped around. There were teams of three in those days, uh, and so we did not finish a team. Uh, but Harry Chamberlain, riding a horse that he had never competed before, won the individual silver. And he won also, he was on the show jumping team as well at the same well, I, I, this he, he won the individual silver medal in show jumping. At the same Olympics, he won the gold team medal on a team. He yeah. was quite a horseman. Yeah, yeah. And... I just want to share um, just a picture of um, yourself here and how much the equitation has been passed passed through. And I and this is where I would love for you to share some of the highlights that you've learned from 
um, Harry and your father and, and coming to the, today, some of the other influences that seem to, there seem to be a common thread amongst some of these horsemen um, that you've learned from. Can you talk a little bit about that common thread? Sure, this, this photo you have up is taken in the steeplechase phase of the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. And I'm riding a horse called Kilkenny, uh, who at that time was a 10 year old uh, Irish sport horse. He was 15 16th thoroughbred. And he was a phenomenal jumper, as you can see here. Uh, the, my position, uh, I'm a little bit more forward possibly than Colonel Chamberlain might have liked, but I'm also going a lot faster uh, than they did over some of their cross country jumps. Uh, he was capable of, of really, really huge leaps. He had jumped six foot six as a young horse uh, with his former rider. So I never had to worry about the horse's scope. Uh, I was, at that time, I was being coached by a British Army officer named Major Joe Lynch, who was the Olympic team coach in 1968. And many of his practices were the same as the American cavalry system. The, the British and the English system had a great deal in common. So I felt very comfortable uh, with his coaching methods. And when is it that, uh... Uh, that Jack LaGolf came into the system and it was it after um, uh, Coach Lynch? Yes, uh, Jack LaGolf joined, uh, he was hired by the equestrian team in 1970. Uh, and he, he moved to Gladstone in late 1970, early 1971 and started coaching the, the American eventing team based out of Gladstone at the time, later out of South Hamilton, Massachusetts, uh, when the team authorized a satellite training facility that was dedicated to eventers only. And that is really a golden period of eventing uh, for the US when Jack Lagoff, shown here, uh, took over. He was a marvelous, marvelous coach. He had an intuitive understanding of his horses. Uh, he was a ruthless disciplinarian. Uh, being a French army officer, uh, he brought the military attitude with him. Uh, things, things operated according to the clock around Jack. Uh, and he put a great deal of pressure on the humans. He rarely put any real pressure on his horses. Uh, this, this is a picture taken, I think, in uh, 1960 in Rome at the Olympics. Jack rode in two Olympics, 1964 uh, and 1960. Uh, and I don't think he had quite a good enough horse to suit his talents, uh, but he finished both times and finished well, both times, of course, riding for the French team. Uh, and then in 1968, he was the coach of the French team uh, in Mexico. And uh, his, his rider, Jacques Guillaume, won the individual gold. So Jack came to us with a, a record of accomplishment already by the time we hired him. He's, he seemed to be an accomplished rider, but more, even more so an accomplished coach. What were some of the strengths that he put together as a coach? Uh, well, as I've mentioned, first of all, he was a marvelous horseman. He was very, very good in his dressage teaching. He had been with the Cadre Noir in France, which is France's version of the, of the uh, Austrian riding school in Vienna, the Leppitz Honors in Vienna. Uh, the Cadre Noir is entirely a dressage-based drill team. And Jack spent, I think, 10 years there with them. So he knew how to sit the trot. And more importantly, he knew how to teach riders how to sit the trot and how to get horses to go well. Then you coupled with that, he had been a steeplechase jockey it's hard to believe it looking at his later photographs, but he had ridden it for race jockey. And uh, so he also had an understanding of, of one, of riding at speed, but two, of preparing horses and riders to ride at speed. He was a great conditioner of horses. Uh, and I think his strongest suit was he could get a thoroughbred fit for a classic event without having the dressage go out the window. His horses remained sane uh, even after they got racing fit. 
and then finally, as I mentioned earlier, he was a real psychologist. He understood his riders. He understood his horses. Uh, he would put a great deal of pressure on some riders and not so much on others. It was a real education watching him work and riding under his tutelage at the time. <clears throat> And, and during those uh, training sessions, was there a, a Bert and Nemethy teaching out of the same uh, vicinity? As uh, well? in, the, in the first few years, yes. We shared the facility at Gladstone. Uh, and we would start at 8 and we would ride till 9.15. And then the jumpers would ride a set 9.30 to 10.30. And we would ride a second set and so on. Uh, so we would swap back and forth during the day. So I had the ability to uh, ride under Jack Legoff, and then I would go down and be jump crew for Bert Denimothy during the break. So I really had the advantages of, of listening to both of the coaches at the same time. And just to be clear, Bert Denimothy was a show jumping coach, yeah? Yes, entirely. Although he had ridden the venting as a Hungarian officer uh, before World War II. The one thing that I love watching, uh, seeing pictures of Bert Nemethy is you could see he had his dressage basics down too. Yes, he was the first trainer to really emphasize uh, the training of uh, the dressage training for show jumpers uh, because the show jumpers in America were a pretty rough and ready group before he got here. You see him here trotting over some Cavaletti poles on the ground. And this was a real hallmark of his system. He used a lot of Cavaletti. He used a lot of gymnastics uh, in training horses. This is a horse that he's on. It's called San Lucas. Lucas was 17 hands uh, and Frank Chapeau competed him. But Bert did a lot of the teaching with this horse. Uh, and you see Bert's position is classic there. You know, posting trot through the Cavaletti, leg at the girth, straight line from his elbow to the horse's mouth, a lovely, loose, soft feeling to the reins as the horse is trotting through. Through your talking, uh, Jimmy, you really emphasize equitation a lot. Um, is that the, the base that most of your coaching coaches have instilled in you is the equitation, the seat, the how much time was spent on the equitation versus getting horses to do what they wanted to do. Can you talk a little bit about the order of that, getting horses to do what you wanted them to do versus equitation and riding correctly? Um, I, talk I a little bit about this. You know, I had a lot of different coaches. I think I had 10 or 12 coaches throughout my international career. Uh, but, but one of the common threads was that the horse goes the way you ride it. And so how you ride is, is going to determine to a great extent your results. Well, then if you accept that logic, then you have to continually be uh, uh, dedicated to Im improving the way you sit, the way you use your aids, the way you approach your horse while you're in the saddle. Uh, and that was true. I had, I had American coaches, I had French coaches, English coaches, um, South American coaches, and, and all of them in one way or another emphasized the way that we did things in the saddle because they already knew that that was going to determine how the horse went. Yeah. Um, when I was reading up on Bert and Nemethy, he talked a lot about gymnastics. Um, how much did gymnastics come into play in riding? Was it primarily done through Bert and Nemethy or was it gymnastics before? Or uh, Because I know anytime you give a clinic, um, you're a master at gymnastics. And I'm guessing that you've learned that through the routes of, from Yeah, to a, Bert. to a great extent through watching Bert and Nemethy's work uh, and becoming a believer in it. Before Bert and Nemethy, horsemen fooled with gymnastics a little bit. Chamberlain makes a brief reference to it in one of his books, uh, but it was not a systematic training tool in the way that it was with Bert. With Bert, it was foundational, it was systematic, it was developmental. Uh, I remember Hugh Wiley told me once, he said, uh, I asked him about about his time, uh, Hugh Wiley, of course, the rider on Nautical, the horse with the flying tail. 
Uh, and Hugh, Hugh laughed. He said, well, Jimmy, he said, when Bert first took over the team, we were all so terrible. None of us could find a stride except Bill Steinkraus. And Bert was afraid to turn us loose. So he made us work in all of these measured distances, knowing that the horses would arrive at the next jump at the correct takeoff. <laughs> <laughs> he said, there's a lot to be said for using gymnastics as a training tool. But that was just Bert protecting the horses from us at the time because we were so green. Uh, and I think, I think, Hugh probably had his tongue in his cheek a little bit talking about that. Uh, but to this day, I still use gymnastics partially for that reason that I know I'm going to get the correct result nine out of 10 times. If I trot into two elements that are 18 feet apart, horses should take one stride. And that is true in America. That's true in Great Britain. That's true in Australia. If the horse bounces that distance or two strides that distance, the horse is wrong. Right. No, and they're going to feel that. about it. That's a yeah. one stride from the trot. End of story. And by the way, if you are working over reasonable heights and spreads, that is a very, very acceptable takeoff point before the second element. Obviously, if the jumps get huge, you have to change the distance. Uh, but most riders don't have to worry about that. I'm guessing the and the repetition will also the riders will get it right after a few repetitions as well. Well, that's that's one of the one of the subtleties of my system is that I gradually expand the number of strides so that as I'm training the horses to maintain an even rhythm, I'm training the riders to start to recognize when there are two strides, three strides, four strides, five strides away from the obstacle, they recognize their situation. A process you and I called timing, uh, the rider's ability to predict and influence the remaining increments of stride before an obstacle. That's timing. And that is a learned skill. There isn't one rider in a generation that is born knowing where their horse's stride is. They exist. I've seen a couple of them uh, over the course of my career, but they are, they're beyond rare. They're almost unique. Most mm. of us have to learn timing as we go along. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's a, it's a little different when somebody posts on social media that you're jumping a four-foot fence at the end of a grid versus a four-foot jump all by itself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I can spoil your day at a clinic if I put up one vertical at the end of the center line and say canter down to this and jump it clean. Right. And there'll be murder for the rest of the day because 99.9% .9 of the riders can't do that. But if I have a placing rail one, two, three, four, five strides away, my success ratio immediately improves. Well, the, the end of our teaching should be that riders succeed, not that they fail. Right. Uh, and this, this is a protective device. Gymnastic training is a protective device for horse and rider. I saw you uh, one time at Morven Park, and now I know exactly what you were doing. I was in the warm up at um, before show jumping and you were standing roughly about oh four strides away from the warm-up jump and you were standing that place and you were instructing going all right how many strides am i away from the jump and you had them counting the strides where yes. you were standing yes. on the way to the jump so yes. before yes. the warm-up you were instilling well that's that's a cheat i mean it's a legal cheat in the warm-up arena you have to imagine the riders are nervous you know, yeah. I have some, I've had some wonderful riders come out of my program, Eric, uh, and I'm, I'm extraordinarily impressed with them. But you have to imagine they were not good riders when they came to me. That's why they came to my program. Right. Uh, they weren't very good yet. Uh, and so there, I could not have a training system that was based on the accuracy of the rider because by definition, bad riders are not accurate. Uh, and so I, I spend a lot of time establishing a good rhythm, establishing a good balance. And then usually my riders start to recognize their stride, three strides away. Well, that's about 40 feet. So where you saw me standing was 42 feet away. 
And you probably heard it because it's under my breath, but I'm saying not yet, not yet, not yet, because nervous riders try and see their stride too soon. Right, right, right. They try and see three strides when they're four strides away or five strides away. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a trainer's trick to say not yet, not yet, not yet. You'll know three strides when you see it. But yeah. three strides exists beyond where I'm standing. And in the meantime, you must maintain, maintain straightness, rhythm, and balance. And that's all you need. And you'll see three strides when it's time to see three strides. Uh, and that works. It's a very effective training tool. Uh, it's about 42 feet away. Three 12 foot strides is 36 plus a four foot takeoff to a three foot fence. That's a very comfortable situation for horse and rider. You know, just talking to you there, you could, you know, we're all learning that obviously you have a system and you're plugging riders and horses through a system. When you were riding for the team and taking instruction from um, Jack LeGoff and, and all these coaches, when was it that you transferred from the student that you start developing your own system and bringing your horses and then competing, not just for the team, but for yourself and competition. And how much were you out on your own besides training under the under Jack LeGolf and, and these big names? Be beginning in 1971, I went out on my own. Uh, and it's at that point, uh, up until that time, I had not been uh, an apprentice coach, but I had been coaching in my mind when I was watching my teammates go and listening to the instruction they were receiving. I was balancing that in my mind with what I would tell that rider in that situation. Uh, I, I want to take, uh, I want to, to uh, disagree with one of your terms. You said you plug in riders. That's not really, uh, you, you understand why I'm raising yeah. this point that each horse and rider are different and they live at a different place on the learning curve. And if I take that rider off that horse and put them on another horse, they're either ahead or behind of that point on the learning curve. And it's the job of the instructor to, to know where that, that partnership is today. And I think that was one of Lagoff's greatest strengths is I've, I've seen him emphasize something today, emphasize it, emphasize it, emphasize it. Uh, and the very next day, he would ignore it completely. Right. And the same thing was going on, but he was waiting, he was allowing time for it to sink in. Yeah. yeah. The rider, you know, he was not, he was not so dedicated to a system that he wasn't willing to adjust, adjust his system to each horse and rider that he was dealing with. Otherwise, he'd just be enabling the rider. Yes, or, or by, by saying, you are at XYZ stage in my system, you will work here. Uh, um, but that doesn't take into account the variations of, that, we, that you and I find with horse and rider. Yeah, yeah. And how much have, um, you know, uh, how much have you developed a system for yourself from what you've learned from students that you started taking on as a professional, adjusting things, uh, calibrating it, uh, or did you, did you move off of, uh, did you move off of the old system? Did you develop your own? Um, how would you? Um, no, my my system is based. My system is based on Harry Chamberlain's system. Yeah. End, end of story. What what you hear from me is a distillation of my learning from Chamberlain, uh, mm -hmm. and I I recommend his. He has two books: Training Hunters, Jumpers, and Hacks, and Riding and Schooling. Uh, and I recommend both of them to readers no, uh, okay. because that's the that's the system. That's a basic system that you need. Now, I, although I trained uh, my students according to the principles laid out in this book, uh, I did not necessarily tell them to do what I would do because I'm a different writer than that student, usually more advanced. 
Uh, and I think it's a classic, uh, let's call them a beginning instructor's mistake to tell the student to do what the rider would do if they were in the saddle. Right. That, that doesn't work because they're not as good as you are. And that, do, that doesn't mean they're, they're terrible. It just means they have not had the experience you've had in the saddle yet. Uh, and until they have had the same hours in the saddle, uh, you know, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours to achieve mastery. Uh, it's no good to tell them to ride like a master. Right. And so you have to have techniques such as a lot of gymnastic training uh, that bring the horse and rider along, not, not to show them what they can't do, but to teach them how to do what they are doing. And as I say, that's different. So my riders, my, my students and I were working towards the same goals, mm -hmm. but they might have been uh, they might have been told to do different things along the way, depending on their, their skill set. Yeah, I would not now, say I want you to do this because that's what I would do on the lift lead coming out of the turn to a vertical on that horse that that presupposes that my student can ride as well as I can. And that's probably not true yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, in every student probably has their very unique style. And it's not the style you necessarily want to change, but more probably the uh, just the outcome is that the horse is, is not you're not in the way of the horse and and um, they're able to achieve the end goal in the end. Yes, you, you referred to my article about Caprilli uh, that I did a few years ago for Practical Horsemen. And the, the interesting thing about the Italian Federico Caprilli is that before Caprilli, uh, horses had to adjust to their riders. And after Caprilli, riders adjusted to their horses. Our system is based on the comfort of the horse. What is the most comfortable way for the horse to carry the weight of the human body? What is the most comfortable way for a rider to maintain contact with the horse's mouth? Is it a rigid fixed hand or is it a supple following hand and arm? Obviously, we know the answer now, but that was not always the answer throughout antiquity. Mm. It's only in a, a little over the last 125 years that we have ridden this way. And that's, that's down to Caprilli. Have you, do you, um, feel that um, uh, the ratio of people competing right now, uh, they've become more of a competitor versus um, learning the horsemanship because there are these phrases that are put out there, especially even in the dressage world, across all horse disciplines, there's competitive dressage versus classical dressage, um, something that makes my hair kind of go up. Um, the competitive, would you agree when Jack LeGolf was on his way out that there was a certain, there's another breed of person coming into the sport that became quite a competitor and how did that change the horsemanship? Um, I, I would turn that around on you and say, uh, at the end of a year's quarantine, I have noticed that riders are riding better. Yeah. Yeah, because, you wrote an article about that. Yes, because they're, that? They're, not, uh, they're not competing on a weekly basis. And so they had more classical, more long-term goals in mind. And that is now showing up. Uh, it will be very interesting over the next four or five months uh, to see how well people ride now, now that they've had, in effect, a year on the bench. Uh, most, of, most of them have not had much of a competitive uh, year over 2020. Uh, and now we come to find out today that Kentucky is on after all. Uh, so we're going, to, we're going to get to see riders who have been able to spend a year practicing at home, improving at home, and now they will come out and they'll, maybe they will prove uh, the people such as you and I that said that 
the emphasis had gotten wrong that we were raising people to be competitors, not riders. Uh, I think we'll see the results of that now in the next four or five months. And I'm going to do a plug for Practical Horsemen and your column in there. You did a lovely um, column on that. Do you remember the, um, the title of that column so people could look that up? Yes, uh, I don't remember the exact title. Uh, it's in the most recent issue. The Practical Horseman prints out a quarterly issue. Uh, and this was something to the effect of uh, uh, some good trends, but some bad news or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, what it was, yeah. And the, uh, to me, the good news entirely was the, the improvement that I saw in all three phases. Of course, I'm an eventing coach. So I wasn't just sitting at the, uh, at the arena of a show jumping competition or of a dressage arena. I was seeing all three phases. And yeah. in my opinion, they had all gotten a lot better. That's great. Um, what was it like working with other teammates from different backgrounds under one coach? Um, teammates like Michael Plum, Bruce Davidson, Michael Page, Kevin Freeman, Denny Emerson, we just had on our live stream, Ralph Hill. Uh, you've worked with some, I, I've looked up to these, uh, to these uh, horsemen as coaches, as, as somebody I want to emulate. And um, from they all came to the level that you're talking about from different backgrounds. What was it like working amongst these team members? Well, especially my first team, my, my teams in 1967, 1968, uh, we were all coming out of the same system. Uh, and that is a hunter jumper equitation background. Don't forget that Mike Page and Mike Plum had won the medal McClay before they became eventers. So their equitation was just as close to flawless as you could get. Uh, it, it isn't until later that we started getting riders who had not had that exposure. Uh, but uh, Kevin Freeman, Mike Page, Mike Plum, I was on the podium in 1968 with three of my heroes. So that was a big thrill. <laughs> And it's interesting, we still talk on the phone, the four of us. Uh, we still gossip. As Kevin Freeman says, we brag about how good we used to be. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting relationship. You never get over being on a team with someone. Uh, they've, wow. always got a, they've always got a special place in your heart uh, for that individual after that experience. Well, give a shout out to them. We'd love to have them on our... Uh live stream interviews here. <laughs> well, I think, I think your, your, not readership, your viewership would be fascinated uh, to talk with any of those guys because they're really giants in this sport. We may even have to organize it where we have all of you on one screen talking amongst each other, have just a conversation. I'd love to hear you all talk together, so. Well, you, you supply the whiskey and we'll take care of the rest. <laughs> <laughs> what would a um, competitor and a trainer's largest asset to preserve good horsemanship in a competitive world? What would be um, a competitor and trainer's largest asset be? For me, and I really, this, it was instinctive with me at first. It was trained, trained into me later on. I had one horse uh, and that horse separated me from average to Olympic level. And I took care of that horse. I worried about that horse 24 seven throughout his career because I knew that I was one bad step away from being on the bench again. Uh, so when I got a horse, this horse you're looking at here is the horse called Castle Wellen, uh, who was a lovely, lovely horse. I think he's the only horse I ever rode that would be equally successful in the short format. Mm. He had he had a ten for a trot and the canter. He had a nine for the walk. Uh, he could he was a very clean show jumper, and being a thoroughbred, he could get the distance of a classic event across country. Uh, most of the horses that I read were such cross country machines that the dressage was marginal. They would not have been a factor these days. 
uh, but Castle Well in here, that's one of the 1984 selection trials at ship's quarters. Mm. Uh, uh, this horse could do it all. Continue with the, the asset that um, you were, I, I, I may have uh, that, uh, my, that, yeah, my My main point is that I only had one horse. And so when riders started to bring horses to me, I trained that horse with the same care because that rider was on a gap year between high school and college. Mom and dad did not approve, but they're going to fund them for one year. And during that time, the horse was going to take a major league swing at being on the USET talent squad. And so as long as that horse stayed sound and competitive, that kid's dreams were still, they still had the potential of realizing their dreams. If I broke their toy, they were going back to college. They were gonna drop off the scene. Uh, and I never got over that, that I had to take care of this horse not take risk with it, condition it very, very, uh, very, very slowly and carefully to produce it in peak condition. Uh, and that, you know, to this day, that is still in the back of my mind when I'm working with horses and riders. Yeah, yeah. So you're looking at a, a way more longevity than just the next, the show next weekend. You're I was, at uh, yes, I was never just looking at this weekend. Yeah. You have a new book coming out. You want to tell us about your uh, new book coming up? Yeah, it's titled Still Horse Crazy After All These Years. And the subtitle is If It Didn't Happen This Way, It Should Have. And these are basically my memoirs, Eric. Uh, I have I've realized over the last few years, I do a lot more looking back than I do forward <laughs> at my age, uh, that I was the Forrest Gump of the horse world. <laughs> and I, I still remember a, an eventing team, all men, all in uniform. Uh, I, I remember the first lady member of an Olympic team. Uh, I remember when the Olympics were no longer all amateur. Uh, and I was, I was present at all of those. I was at Chicago in 1959 at the Pan American Games when they founded the USCTA, the US Combined Training Association, which is the forerunner of USEA, US Eventing Association these days. Uh, and I was one of the first life members of that organization when we had fewer than 200 members. Uh, we, were, we were basically a cult with a, uh, with a membership card. And, and now we have, you know, 12 to 14,000 members a year. Uh, I was around when we changed the American Horse Show Association from a membership of horse shows, just as the name of the organization uh, represents, uh, to become an individual member association. That was a revolutionary change uh, because that set the stage for the National Federation to be more responsive to the, to the needs of the membership rather than being responsive to one or 200 horse show organizers as it was prior to that revolution. Uh, so I was around for an awful lot of changes in the horse world. And I certainly tell my readers where I was at that time and what I was doing and what horses I was riding and uh, what successes I was having, what failures I was having. And uh, at the same time, I make the point that I sort of, I developed as the horse sport developed. Uh, and so it's a, it's a way of kind of saving the history of horse sports in this country from 1950 to the present. That's, that's awesome. And you know, I have to say, uh, last month we had Denny Emerson uh, as a guest speaker. And he spoke of four attributes of a great horseman. And Jimmy, you've really showed us how much you contribute back to the sport as a um, just a responsible. Uh, he was talking about one of the biggest uh, attributes is. 
to have a certain responsibility back to the sport. Um, Boy, Denny, and, is the, he's the exemplar of that, right? Yeah. Anyone that's crazy enough to be the president of the USEA. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that and is someone still, who has paid their debt. To society. Back and, yeah, yes. And, and I really appreciate you giving us your time as well. Um, I want to thank you uh, just uh, deeply. I've always been a big fan. And I want to thank uh, everyone here on this Zoom call. You can get a um, copy of this interview through idcta.org. You'll also find out how to become a member and some of the other good programs that we have to offer there. Um, but again, Jimmy, thank you very much. We're going to be looking for this book. Where can we find it? Uh, you can find it. Go to www.trafalgarbook.com. Dot com, T R A F A L G A R books dot com. Wonderful. And then you can pre order this. This is intended to be released at Kentucky. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone, and good night.